Uh, well, let's look at Psalm 69 together. Uh, we're going to look at 18 verses. We are not going to cover all the all, all of Psalm 69. I debated on that. Uh, it really is my preference. Uh, if I'm preaching on something, that I read all the verses, and so I decided to just kind of focus on the first 18 verses of this psalm today. So let's look at see what God's word has to say to us. It says this: "Save me, O God." For the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What I did not steal, must I now restore? O oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me, O Lord God of hosts. Let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, O God of Israel. For it is you, it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the talk of those who sit in the gate, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to my soul, redeem me, ransom me because of my enemies. Let's pray together. Father, these are the words of a desperate man. And I wonder if there's anyone in this room who would also identify themselves as being desperate. In those situations where they know unless you do something, they're not going to make it. Help them, Lord. Help them this morning. Help us all to turn to you. May the next few minutes be more than just the accumulation of information. But may it be an encounter with you the living God, for each and every one of us. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Where well, I'm tempted to subtitle Psalm 69 as you thought your life was bad. <laughs> um, the words we just read are raw and visceral, and we're going to talk about them in a minute. But as I was, uh, as I was reading these words this week, and, and uh, especially the first part of that, I remembered years ago, and again I'm dating myself, and I'm doing it by television shows, which I seem to always do, but years ago, um, the show Magnum P.I., raise your hand if you watched Magnum P.I. Oh, yeah, a lot of you did. Yeah, yeah, great show. I loved it. You know, it was, you know, instrumental in, in my generation. And, you know, but anyway, there was an episode from Magnum P.I. that really captivated me. It captivated me then, 
um, it was an episode where uh, Tom Selleck, who, who was the lead character, of course, uh, on July 4th, he had this thing where he would go out in the middle of the ocean and just kayak by himself. His friend TC, remember TC who flew the helicopter, literally dropped him out of the helicopter with his kayak. And, and he was out there all by himself. He did this every July 4th. Well, a speedboat comes along and he capsizes and loses his kayak and he's out there all by himself. And so the entirety of the episode, uh, Magnum is treading water. And that fascinated me at the time, you know, watching him, and I was a pretty good swimmer, but I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, that would be horrific to be out there in the middle of the ocean treading water. And so he starts having these flashbacks, right, thinking about his father, and it's a really moving episode. And, but he's out there and he, he has, there's no hope of it. I mean, he knows he can't swim to shore. He's too far out. It's just, he would use up too much energy and, and, and he would die that way. And so there's sharks coming around him and it's, it's, just, it's, a, it's a frightening episode. And of course, what happens in the end? His friends rescue him, right? Because they have this sense that something's wrong with Magnum. And so they, they, get in, they get in TC's helicopter and they go look for him and they, re they rescue him. Well, I was thinking about that this week. It, when, when, when David, the writer of Psalm 69, says this, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. What an amazing visual picture David is giving us here. The, the New American Standard Bible actually translates that last phrase, For the waters have threatened my life. So this is what David is, is saying here. When he says the waters have, have come up to my neck, he's talking about a life-threatening situation. And, and of course, David is not saying that he is literally drowning. That's not, that's not what Psalm 69 is about. It's not about a literal water event for David. He's saying that, that all that he is going through, his life circumstances, have caused him to be in a position that he compares to drowning. Going through the life circumstances that he is going through feels like drowning to him. He's, he's, up, he's in up to his neck and he knows that he can't get out of this situation by himself. He has to be rescued. That's his only hope in this life situation that he's going through. And I've often heard this. I mean, friends and others you know, in, in my life, I've also often heard people talk about going through different situations or weeks or months or days in their life where they feel like they're drowning. You ever heard somebody say that? I just feel like I'm, I'm drowning. And sometimes we, we get in those situations. Life is so hard and difficult that it feels like we, we're going to go under. It, it feels like that, that, that if something doesn't happen, if we're not rescued, we're, we're going to go under. And, and, and I wonder if some of you here this morning feel the same way right now. There's a lot of people here this morning. It's a good group. And, and I wonder if, if in a group this size, there's, there's somebody who walked in the door and you would identify yourself as being in a life circumstance that feels as though you're drowning. That feels as though you're up to your neck. Or, or maybe some of you have felt this way before and can relate to that and, and can remember that. Or, or quite frankly, maybe some of us will feel this way sometime in our future. Again, why do we get into those situations? Why do we get into the situations where we feel as though we're, we're drowning? Well, it could be a hundred of, hundred, hundreds of reasons, right? And, and as you read Psalm 69, I think David presents at least three reasons related to his situation, to him being up to his neck. David says this, he says that he has enemies, powerful enemies, who hate him without cause. He says he's being treated, un, treated unjustly, and, and, and he says he's made to, uh, he puts it sort of like this, he's made to pay for things he did not steal. So he's being treated unjustly by, by enemies. So he mentions that as being one of the reasons why he's up to his neck. But he also mentions his own wrongdoing. And that's important. At least some of what he's going through, he says, is self-inflicted. And so he acknowledges that while he uh, ha is hated without cause, it doesn't mean that he is perfect. 
It doesn't mean that he himself is without sin and fault in, in the situation. But then he also says this. He talks about his enemies. He talks about his own wrongdoing. But he also says something else. He says to God that David is saying to God that he is bearing the reproach of others because of God. David is saying that he is in the situation that he is in for God's sake. So David is up to his neck because he is God's servant doing what God wants him to do. So there's at least three reasons that David points to as to why he's drowning. And again, these are three completely different reasons for his peril, but they're all connected. And like David, maybe you and I, in the struggles that we're facing, maybe we're in these situations for more than one reason. Maybe we're in these situations because of what other people are doing to us. Maybe we're in this situation because of what we have brought upon ourselves. Maybe we're in this situation because we're doing what God wants us to do and the road is hard and becoming more difficult. And by the way, that happens. Just because you're following God doesn't mean that everything will be rosy and it'll be easy. Sometimes God leads you down a very difficult road. And you may be feeling like you're drowning because you're doing exactly what God wants you to be doing. So again, David is in this situation. But regardless of why he's up to his neck, regardless of the, why, the reason why uh, you may be drowning, what do you do when you're up to your neck? What do you do when you're drowning? Well, David gives us some information about that. So when you're drowning, what do you do? Well, do this. Be real and urgent with God. Oh, I think this is so important. Be real with God. Be urgent with God. I love the raw and visceral, visceral way that David prays to God. And, and I noticed this uh, this week as I was meditating on Psalm 69, I noticed this. As David prays for rescue from God, you don't hear David say this. Not once in Psalm 69 do you hear David say this. God, if it is your will, then. <laughs> Not once. Not once do you hear God, David say to God, if it's your will, then save me. Not, not once. David is not going to be satisfied. The only way David is going to be satisfied in his praying is if things turn out in one specific way. Hear him say this to God over and over again. Save me. Deliver me. Answer me. David's not messing around. David's not praying the Sunday school prayer that he thinks he's supposed to pray. David's getting real with God. Now, you and I know, I hope we do, you and I know that it's always right for us to pray for God's will to be done. Always. It's always right for us to pray this, even if it means that our will is not done. This is so important. Sometimes in our praying, we, we evaluate prayer and the success of prayer based on whether or not we get what we want through prayer. Mm. Our, prayer our praying needs to mature if, if that's the sum total of, of our praying. So we should know and understand that it's always right for us to pray for God's will to be done. That's a settled matter. But David doesn't really care about that here. <laughs> That's not really the focus of David's praying here. In fact, he boldly cries out to God and demands rescue from God. He knows that God is his only hope. And he knows that, that there's no reason to pussyfoot around in his praying. Right or wrong, David is going to be real and urgent with God in his praying. So hear this this morning. I want you to hear this. This is so important. It is better to pray wrong prayers than no prayers at all. Now, if you just take my statement there and just walk out the door with it, it might cause trouble. <laughs> but let's talk about what I mean by that. Let's talk about what that means. It's better to pray wrong prayers than no prayers at all. 
I'm certainly not encouraging you in your prayer life to be immature and to not to grow in a better understanding of, of, of how to pray and the true, what the true meaning of prayer is. But listen, I would rather you pray wrong than not at all. And I suspect that there are more people who are not praying at all than those who are praying wrong prayers. I think we have a, a bigger problem with people who aren't praying than we do with people who are praying in the wrong way. And I think for some, the first step is just start praying. Sometimes given your circumstances, the best thing to do is to just be real and urgent, to, to cry out to God, to express how you feel. He knows anyway. He knows exactly what you're feeling. Sometimes I think when we pray, whether it be in groups or whether it be as individuals, we're praying some prayer, oh Lord, this, that, and the other, and God's saying, why don't you just tell me what you really mean? Why don't you quit trying to impress the person sitting next to you uh, in the way you're praying? And why don't you just pray what you really mean, what you're really thinking, what's really on your heart? When you're alone, you know, instead of being calculated in the way you're praying, why don't you just tell me what, what's on your heart, what, 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 what you're feeling, what, what you really mean? It's, again, this is so important. Being real and honest with God is always, always, always the right way to pray. It's always the best way to pray, to be real and honest before Him. And listen, if you're real and honest before God and you're praying, He can sort things out from there. He can change you and mature you. And if your praying is immature or if you're praying for things that maybe aren't necessarily the best thing for you to be praying for, He'll work in your heart and life. But you know what won't happen? God won't change you in that way if you're not praying, <laughs> if you're not going to Him. And I think that's a much bigger problem. Because instead of crying out to Him, you're drowning. And you're crying for the Coast Guard to come save you. You're crying, you're crying for Captain America or Aquaman, I guess it would be more appropriate, to come save you. But you're not praying to God. You're not crying out to Him, and you're not just being real with Him, and you're praying. I mean, you're, you're praying to God any given time, and, and God's like, well, listen, you're missing, let's talk about the elephant in the room. You're praying about this, 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 and this, and you're not really asking me the thing that you want to ask. You're not really praying about the thing that's causing you to be drowning right now. Listen, be real and honest and urgent in your praying. By the way, I stopped with verse 18. Have any of you read the following verses in Psalm 69? When you get a chance, read them, because you'll also see or hear more of David's honest prayers as David is calling down God's wrath on his enemies. Even saying that, David is even saying to God that he doesn't want his enemies to be considered to be a part of God's people. Some of you are going to read that, you're going to scratch your head and saying, that doesn't sound like Jesus. <laughs> well, it doesn't. But it's what David was feeling. <laughs> and it was real. And we could go into reasons, and, but, but let's just talk about the reality of it. It's what was on his heart, and he was expressing what was on his heart. Right or wrong is what David was feeling, and he expressed it to God. And it's better to do that than to not approach God with what you are feeling or experiencing at all. You're drowning. When you're drowning, you don't say, uh, hey, anybody, um, if it's okay with you, could you save me? Uh, God, um, I, I know you're busy. I know you got a lot of things, other things going, and I know there are people that are starving in Africa, but hey, if you get a chance, could you look my way? No, that's not how you're going to pray when you're drowning. When you're drowning, you're going to say, save me! Help! Now! 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 Some of you need to pray like that and to be real and urgent in your praying right now. But also when you're drowning, trust in who God is. 
I love this about Psalm 69. David says this, But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. Now David has been talking about a few groups of people. David up to this point has been talking about his enemies. He even says something that's, that's kind of humorous, but it, he didn't mean it in a humorous way. He said that the, the drunkards are writing songs about me. Okay, I mean, so, so the, 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 the town winos are, 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 are writing songs about me and singing about me in derision. So he's talking about his enemies and all the grief that he's receiving from his enemies, but he's also talking about those that are righteous. He's talking about those who are not his enemies, those who are righteous. And David is concerned that what David has done, David's wrongdoing that he mentioned earlier, could negatively affect the righteous and could cause grief for the righteous. So he's talking about these other people, but then he turns and he says, but as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. David says, I have enemies, I have people in my life who are faithful to you that I feel may be dragged down into this with me, but you are the one, God, you are the one I'm turning to. You're my focus right now. You're the one I'm, I'm, I'm crying out to. What others think doesn't matter to me right now. My prayer is to you. And by saying this, David was also saying, and God, I know who you are. Notice how David appeals to God's already revealed character as he prays to be saved by God. David says this, he says, in the abundance of of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. And David says, answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good according to your abundant mercy. Turn to me. Now, David knew these things about God, and it's very likely that David learned these things about God from a passage in Exodus that we're about to look at, which actually means that David learned these things about God from God because this little passage in Exodus was God's way of naming himself right after the incident with the golden calf where you see quite a bit of dialogue between God and Moses. God tells Moses to go up on the mountain and, and Moses stands before God and God himself makes this declaration about himself to Moses. In Exodus 34, it says this, God says this about himself. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Now I want you to hold on to that last phrase for just a bit. We'll get that to that in a minute. But, but hearing these words, knowing these words, David understood who God was and that was the basis of his prayer to God. The foundation of David's prayer to God was God himself and knowing who God himself was. God, I know who you are. I've been taught this about you. I've learned this about you through experience. You have shown me this about you. And this is what I know that you can do. And this is what you it's what David knew, and it's what you can know also. David knew this. No matter what you have done or what has been done to you, God never changes. Maybe you're in up to your neck. Maybe you're drowning because of what you've done. Most of my drowning is because of that, by the way. <laughs> Maybe you're in up to your neck because of what you have done. Or maybe you're in up to your neck because of what is being done to you. Maybe so. A lot of things can be true, but this is also true. No matter what, God never changes. 
And the basis of your prayer is who God is. David's prayer was not based on what David could do or David's own abilities. David knew that that wasn't even close enough to save him. David's prayer wasn't based on just being persuasive enough to make God help him. Maybe if I just pray long enough and hard enough, God will come around. That wasn't the basis of David's prayer. And David's prayer wasn't because David was always right and everyone else was always wrong. That wasn't the basis of David's prayer because we know that wouldn't be true, that David was wrong sometimes also. The basis of David's prayer, the foundation of David's prayer was all about who God is. That was the source of David's hope in his drowning situation. And it was his basis for praying in such a bold way. Once again, are you drowning? Are you praying? And as you are praying, are you basing your prayer on the understanding of who God really is? Do you understand and know who He is? What He is capable of doing, what He wants to do, what He has revealed, meaning what He has revealed about Himself says about His desires, His mercy, His compassion, His love. Are you aware of this? Is there a chance that understanding this can change your outlook when you're up to your neck? And can it affect the way you pray? David wasn't calling out for a random God to help him. He was calling out, crying out to the God he knew to help him. There's a difference. When you're crying out to the God you know to help you, then there's hope. There's hope. But one more thing. When you're drowning, know this. Know Jesus understands. What I just said about praying to the God you know, and when you pray to the God you know, then you really do have hope. Well, I want you to hear this this morning also. Jesus is your true hope. He's your true hope. I don't see Jesus' name anywhere here in Psalm 69, Pastor. Why are you always pulling Jesus out of these Psalms? <laughs> Why are you reading, reading the Psalms and telling me about Jesus? I don't see Jesus' name mentioned here. Well, sure. But if you know what you're looking for, and if you know who you're looking for, you'll see Jesus all over Psalm 69. He's all over it. And the New Testament writers often quoted Psalm 69 in reference to Jesus. This is one of the most quoted Psalms in the New Testament, especially as it relates to Jesus himself. And there's several statements in Psalm 69 that were fulfilled through Christ and also are a reflection of Christ and what he went through. So here are just a few, and it really is a few. I just, I may not be covering everything that Psalm 69 would say about Jesus, but here are just a few things that it says. First, it says this, it says, more in number than the hairs of my head. Wait a minute. I know what you're thinking. More numbers than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Jesus had enemies. And at the very, very last moments leading up to his crucifixion, his enemies were loud and raucous. And the crowd said, crucify him. He says, Psalm says, the psalm says, for it is you, for, it is for your sake that I have borne reproach. And then it says, zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. David is talking to God. That, is an, that last part especially is, is specifically quoted in relation to Christ himself. The disciples remembered this about Jesus zeal for his house and how he cleared the temple. Again, they, they quoted this in reference to Jesus. And then it says this, 
I have become a stranger to my brothers. If you read the Gospels and noticed how Jesus related to his, bio, his earthly family, his brothers, they thought he was a lunatic, right? They were trying to stop him because they thought he'd gone off the deep end. Now later, at least one of his brothers came to Christ, right? James. <laughs> but during his life in ministry, he was rejected by his own brothers, meaning Mary's sons. Then it says, I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. What happened when Jesus was arrested? What happened to his disciples? Whoosh, they scattered. They struck the shepherd, and the sheep were scattered. All of a sudden, Jesus, who at one point was followed by crowds of people, is now all alone at his greatest hour of need. And then it says, for thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Well, that's a direct reference to the cross, right? It was fulfilled when Christ was on the cross. We're told in the Gospels that, that he was given sour wine to drink, which was a very cheap drink and a very cheap way of quenching thirst. Jesus was given this when He was on the cross. So as you see, here in Psalm 69, there are several re direct references to either prophetic things about Jesus or ways that Psalm 69 illustrates and intensifies or, or the understanding of, of what Jesus went through. And, and David himself in Psalm 69, what David is saying he is going through, David is the king of Israel. He is representing the people of Israel. So what David is saying about himself is also, also applies to the struggles that the people of Israel have faced, the difficulties that they faced, and their great need of being saved. And Jesus is David's descendant by birth, who was the promised one, through which the promise was that David's throne would be eternal. So we see the connection there between David as the representative of Israel, Jesus as the future Messiah to come and the forever King of God's people. We see these connections, but we also know this, David was not perfect at all. He was sinful. The people of Israel were not perfect. They were sinful. You and I are not perfect. We are sinful. David speaks for all of us when he says this, Oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. This is true of David. This is true of the people of Israel. This is true of you and me. It's not true of Jesus. David is speaking for you and me. But he's not speaking for Jesus. Remember what God said about himself in Exodus. We just read this a minute ago. God said about himself, who will by no means clear the guilty. Have you ever read that verse and scratched your head and said, what, what does that mean? God is basically saying he's full of compassion and mercy, right? And then he turns around and says, but I'm going to punish people for sin. I'm, I'm going to dig down deep and people are going to be punished for their sin. It doesn't seem to be consistent, right? Well, God is saying here that there will be punishment for sin. God is saying here that there will be a payment, there's a payment to be made. And this is where all that Psalm 69 says about David and all the ways that you and I can relate to the situations mentioned there and how we feel that we're sometimes drowning. None of us, none of us, none of us can say this. None of us can say that we understand what Jesus went through because while you and I are up to our necks sometimes, we're not sinless, but Jesus is. Hear this, Jesus did no wrong, but he took your wrongs to the cross. So when I say that when you look at Psalm 69, you understand, you can, you can, you can realize that Jesus understands you. What I'm not saying is, is that you can understand Jesus. Because you never in your life understood what it meant to be sinless and to suffer for those who were sinful. Jesus understands what you're going through, but you don't understand what Jesus went through. It's much more than what it sounds like. Jesus knows what it's like to be drowning. 
like you feel like you're drowning sometimes, but He knows more. He knows a type of suffering that you'll never face because He went there for you. You're in up to your neck. You're drowning. What are you doing? Are you crying out to God? You should be. You should be urgently and with, with sincerity and just in a real way saying, Lord, save me. Again, you can pray that and you can, you can be real before God because you know who God is. You know that He's full of love and compassion and mercy and able to save. But, but understand this too. No matter what you're going through on this earth, and it can be incredibly difficult, and maybe you are drowning. Maybe you're drowning in your, in your marriage. Maybe you're drowning uh, in your home life. Maybe you're drowning in your job. Maybe just you're drowning because you're, you're experiencing depression and anxiety in your own life, and that's a very real thing. You maybe have all kinds of reasons why you're drowning. Maybe you've done something, and because you've done something, it's caused a lot of problems in your life, and you're drowning because of that. Understand this. Jesus is your hope. Jesus is your hope because He suffered for you so that no matter what you go through in this life, eventually you can be delivered from your suffering. Maybe it is just temporary and maybe just around the corner there's a tomorrow that you don't, can't see right now that's going to mean you're rescued and, and, and you're no longer up to your neck. Or maybe you go through a, a very difficult time in this life but Deliverance is going to come when the Lord Jesus returns and, and, and takes you home. But one way or the other, you will be delivered if you're a believer in Jesus Christ because He suffered on your behalf. He's your hope. He's your hope. And He understands. I, again, uh, thinking about this this week, um, really, really, really um, praying and in. And, and, Anticipating the possibility that, that there could be somebody here that, that needs to hear what Psalm 69 has to say. And maybe you're connected to it this morning. Maybe you relate. And, 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 and maybe right now at this very moment is your opportunity to, to cry out to God in a way you haven't yet in your circumstances, in your difficulties. And um, I just encourage you to not leave this room until you've had the opportunity to communicate what you're really feeling to God. He's a big God. He can handle it. And um, maybe you didn't come in here this morning thinking about doing that. Maybe you didn't come here with an openness on your heart to be open and real before God, but, but it's always the right thing to do. Uh, maybe there's somebody here that, that, that you would take their hand and say, hey, can we pray right now? I mean, I know... You know, the, the, the praise team's up here singing, and I know that everybody's standing. But can we just leave this room and go pray somewhere? Because I need to talk to somebody, and I need to be real and honest. Paul and I will be up front like we always are. And maybe you're going, we can't pray for 30 minutes with you up front, obviously, but we can at least pray with you here and then maybe even set up a time to, to visit later if you need to talk. Um, but, but the best use of, of the remaining moments that we have together this morning is for you to just be real and open before God. But again, closing on that last thought, no matter what you're going through, Christ Himself knows and understands. And that it's not just trite to say that. He really does know and understand. You, you may not realize that, but He does. He does. He knows and He understands. And that's who you need to go to this morning. Cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. He's that one that's getting ready to swoop in and snatch you up, lift you out of the waters, as we sang earlier. He's the one that's going to rescue you. Don't look to me for that. Don't look to somebody else for that. Look to Him.